the 66 per square centimeter. 10 to the minus 66, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Emma? Aram Koran, yeah? All right, so first, like the other speakers, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together such a, a diverse and exciting workshop. I've really been having a good time here. Um, and this is kind of a, a rare pleasure for me to be able to give a talk in which the title uh, consists almost entirely of single syllable words that as a theorist, you know, as a, as a physicist in general, this happens only very rarely. And the only reason there's a two syllable word is because Ben Schumacher happened to make qubit a two syllable word. Um, and the objective is really going to be to try to answer this question, where and when can a qubit be located in space and time? Uh, and that's a very general kind of question, but I hope that by the end of the 50 minutes, you'll, uh, you'll feel that we've, we've given some kind of useful answer to that question. And to start out, I'm going to you know, start with the quantum information bedrock that uh, Andy Yao already discussed at some length this morning, uh, and that is the no cloning theorem. Here we have uh, Austin Powers and his his clone, Mini-Me, who you can see is not actually a perfect clone. Um, but uh, this is uh, at least uh, in some form prohibited by quantum mechanics, perhaps even the imperfect clones uh, uh, thanks to Andy's formulas. Uh, but as we know, we can't transform uh, an arbitrary unknown quantum state into two copies of that quantum state. Uh, it's been known since 1982, if not before. Um, and we can rephrase that as saying that quantum information cannot be replicated in space. Um, Fair enough, we all agree. Um, and yet, uh, here I'll draw not, a, not space, but a space-time diagram. So uh, spatial coordinate on the horizontal axis, time on the vertical axis. And imagine that we have a spin uh, located at some point in space-time, and then it follows some trajectory. Uh, then obviously, that quantum information follows the spin around uh, and is actually replicated at many points in space-time, even though it can only be at one point uh, in space at a time. Uh, and in fact, because quantum mechanics is unitary, not only can quantum information be replicated in space-time, it has to be. Right? You can't destroy quantum information. Uh, and so this, uh, the point of this talk is going to be to really try to understand in what ways quantum information ca can be replicated in space and time. And if the answer were only this, uh, this simple uh, quantum information follows trajectories, uh, then this wouldn't be a very interesting talk. So I'll just uh, give you the, the spoiler, uh, which is that we will find that there are very interesting ways to replicate quantum information in space and time. Uh, and just to see that this notion of trajectory is inadequate for dealing with the task, uh, we can look at some familiar uh, effects in quantum information. And um, the first one is teleportation. And I think most people in the room know about teleportation, but there were some students who weren't quantum information theorists, so maybe it's worth just mentioning briefly. Uh, the objective is to uh, transmit a quantum state from lo one location to another, uh, but only using classical communication. And we know that uh, trying to measure a, a quantum system is going to damage the state, and so uh, a priori one might have thought that you couldn't communicate quantum information using only you know, classical communication over the phone. And the trick is to use entanglement. That if you have a bell pair and you bring it into contact, uh, or well, into the vicinity of the state that you want, system you want to transmit, you can jointly measure one half of the bell pair send the result to the location where the other half of the bell pair is located, uh, and based on the tran classical transmission, uh, you perform some unitary fix-up on your state, you, uh, you transform it in some way, and ultimately the quantum information ends up at the destination, a quantum system in exactly the same state as the original system. And uh, if you try to look at this in terms of trajectories, then you might say, oh, no problem. The, you know, 
uh, the, the quantum information follows a very clear trajectory uh, right through, uh, well, from this location, through the measurement, uh, through the classical communication, and to the destination. But then you're forced to the conclusion that classical, you know, classical communication over the phone can carry quantum information, uh, which is clearly wrong because the communication over the phone line is, uh, is decohered. Uh, other proposals have been to say, no, no, actually what is really going on here is that the quantum information travels forwards in time, gets reflected backwards in time through the measurement, and then travels forwards in time again. I mean, maybe you can make sense of that, but it seems like a pretty fanciful interpretation of what's going on to me. And I would just say that trajectories are not the right way to think about this. Um, so another example that actually makes contact with uh, what was discussed this morning in
in the task. <coughs> All right. So in the previous slide, I assumed that the quantum, uh, uh, that the information was originally localized at this point S, which was in the past of the request points. But here, the, yeah. Um, I think it. I think it does change the game, because if so, yeah. It, this is a, a constraint which you just know it's a promise uh, that, however, the requests are distributed, uh, only one of the request points is going to is going to receive it. If you didn't receive that promise, then it would be it would be harder to succeed at this task, uh, right? That there'd be additional conditions. Um, and so I, I'm interested specifically in this version because this is the version that's going to ultimately correspond to localizing information in space-time. Uh, but I agree. I mean, uh, if you wanted to build some cryptographic scheme out of this or something, then you might be concerned that there's this promise that is, is, is somehow hard to enforce. Um, but I just want to think about it uh, abstractly for the moment. Is that OK? Um, OK. So here is another situation where the information is originally localized, but at the same time as the request points. And so it's impossible, um, well, from this point S, we don't know whether the information is going to have to go to Z0 or Z1. And so the best you can do from point S is maybe to propagate, you know, to move this spin along the TX plane in the direction of the Zs, but you don't know whether it should go to the left or, th or to the right. Uh, and this, is this example is specifically designed so that direct transmission is, is impossible. And you might look at it and think, well, is it, you know, can this be done at all? And it turns out that it's not too hard to succeed, but you have to exploit teleportation. And so what you do is you share an EPR pair uh, between this space-time point S uh, and, say, Y0. And so now that there are three particles involved, two of them located at the space-time point S. And then you initiate teleportation at the point S. Right? So you, use the two, you, you perform the Bell measurement on the two particles located at, uh, at space-time point S. And then you have some information that came out of the measurement. And you might think, well, what should I do with this, with this information now? Because I don't know where it's supposed to go. Should it go to Z0 or should it go to Z1? But it's classical information. And so you, you can duplicate it and send it to both. Uh, and so you duplicate your classical information, send it to both Z0 and Z1. Uh, and then you, you think about, well, what about the other half of the PR pair, which is required to complete the teleportation? If the request appeared at Y0, then you just forward that quantum information to, to Z0. Uh, and at Z0, you'll get both the classical uh, outcome of the measurement, you'll get the, the half of the PR pair, and you can complete the teleportation. <laughs> Whereas if the, if the request did not appear at Y0, then you just send the half of the PR pair to, Z, to Z1, to the other half. And again, at Z1, you get both halves uh, of the information, the classical and the half of the entanglement, and you can recover the quantum information. And so I think this is actually, it's a nice example, because it really illustrates how, uh, in order to understand how quantum information can be distributed in space and time, uh, in, in this example, you're, making, you're exploiting the fact that in teleportation, quantum information is split into two halves. And the classical part of it is not constrained by the no cloning theorem. Uh, the quantum part of it, which is entanglement, is not really constrained by causality. Uh, and so in that way, you actually can get around the constraints. Well, you're not waiting. You know, you know right away at why not, right? This is a space-time point. Right. Uh, yeah, the, the request, because it's only, there are only two possibilities, right? The request is either for Z0 or for Z1. Right. If, you, if at why not you receive the request, you know, it should go, you, you know the PR pair should go to Z0. If you didn't receive it, you know it had to go to Z1. Um, so you're not waiting for anything. Uh, right, the, the key. Oh, so, so, yeah. at, so at Y0, that's where the half of the PR pair is. Yes, exactly. Okay, or, or at Y1, that's where it's being sent. Uh, well, Y1, nothing actually happens at Y1, no. 
right? But it's important that Z1 is in the future of Y0, right? So that you can actually send this message from Y0 to Z1. Is that to? No, wait, so, so at, well, well, my, my zero is where the, the, the M and the PR pair is. Exactly. And that's where, and the request comes where again? Well, there, there's, a either, there's a request either at Y0 or Y1. Okay, so what if the request comes at Y1? Well, then at Y0, you don't hear anything, don't hear which anything. is information. You know, you know oh, that, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you, 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 you know in advance. Uh, the configuration of, uh, of request and reveal points. Good. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, so that's, a, again, a, an interesting example. Um, and in this situation, again, the only operative constraint is going to be that the, uh, say, the reveal point Z1 had to be in the future of the request point Y0 or vice versa in order to make this work. And from now on, we're going to for forget about the, orig the original location of the quantum information and just assume that it's in the, uh, in the past of the reveal points. Right, so that's the only constraint there. So now I want to connect this to the idea of replication of quantum information in space-time. And so I'll define the causal diamond, dj, associated with the request point yj and the reveal point zj as the intersection of the future of the request point and the past of the reveal point. So it just looks like these diamonds here. There's the future of the request point y0 and the past of the re reveal point z0. Um, and so I have two uh, causal diamonds, D0 and D1. And the diamond DJ consists of all points in spacetime that can depend on whether or not the request appears at the associated reveal point, and that can also affect whether or not uh, the information can appear where it's supposed to appear at the, at the reveal point. And so we can actually define um, what it means for the information to be localized to this causal diamond uh, to be uh, by saying that the summoning task, uh, we can succeed at the summoning task. That if we can succeed at the summoning task, that means that the quantum information, say for, for Y0, has to be in some location that can be reached from Y0, uh, and it has to actually be uh, distributed in such a way that can also affect whether or not uh, it, it is ultimately localized at Z0. And so this game that we've defined is actually exactly the game that we need in order to uh, give an operational definition of how quantum information can be localized to a, a diamond in space-time. And we had this kind of complicated definition of, or complicated result on when summoning was possible. We can rephrase it in the diamonds in kind of simpler language. So we'll say that two of these diamonds are causally related if it's possible to send, so D0 and D1 are, re are causally related if it's possible to send a message from somewhere in D0 to somewhere in D1, or from somewhere in D1 to somewhere in D0. Right? So there's some causal relationship between the diamonds. They're not entirely space-like separated. Uh, and the condition for summoning to, pos to be possible uh, is that the two diamonds are related. Um, that's what we've found so far. And a little bit of causal diamond geometry, uh, for those of you who aren't too familiar with these things. Uh, these causal diamonds can be foliated by space-like surfaces in such a way that there's actually a unitary time evolution from one surface to the next. Uh, and what that means is that if the quantum information is present anywhere in the diamond, it has to be present on each and every one of those space-like slices. And in particular, we can just focus attention. Uh, this, this causal diamond is the intersection of two cones. And so uh, at, the, at the waist where those two, the, the boundaries of those two cones intersect, we have a sphere. Um, and so this whole game is actually equivalent to, say, to saying that the quantum information is localized to the sphere at the sort of the waist of those two diamonds. And so if you preferred, what we're, what we're actually doing here is just talking about localizing quantum information to spatial spheres at, uh, at given times. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a choice we can make if we want to. Uh, we, we, we can speak in more general terms if we want to, but if you're sort of confused by causal diamonds, you can just say that what we're actually talking about is localizing quantum information to spatial spheres at different times, which is a pretty concrete picture. Um, you can generalize a little bit. There's no reason that the reveal point has to have the, the same spatial coordinate as the request point. Uh, and so you could imagine an inertial observer who passes through both of those two points. And from his point of view, the waste is again a sphere. And so you, you could extend the picture a little bit and say we're, uh, we're talking about localizing quantum information to spatial spheres, or what, what look like spatial spheres to arbitrary inertial observers. 
and a little bit more geometry, you can see that as we move the reveal point closer to the boundary of the light cone of the request point, closer and closer, this diamond gets thinner and thinner. And ultimately, if you move the request point onto the boundary, it, uh, the diamond degenerates to a line segment. And in the examples that I'm going to speak about from now on, uh, they're actually going to look in, like this degenerate case. Not because it's particularly interesting, but just because I'm not a great artist, uh, and it's easier to draw line segments than intersecting cones. Um, but in deference to Jacob Beckenstein, you should imagine that these are not uh, totally de degenerate, but they're just actually very thin causal diamonds. So we can actually squeeze some, some information into the diamond and not none. Uh, and to make progress on this question, uh, we've already seen that we, we need teleportation. We're actually also going to need quantum error correction. Um, and again, I think most of the audience is familiar with quantum error correction. Um, and uh, Alex Lobotsky gave this very beautiful talk yesterday about some quite sophisticated ideas in quantum error correction. I, I only need the most basic ideas. So say encoding a spin one particle into a spin three particle. I guess on the left here, I just have an, another sophisticated version of quantum error correction. But on the right, uh, essentially what we're going to do, um, we're going to have quantum information. Again, a quantum system in an unknown state uh, will prepare the other two spins and known states. If you choose the right Hamiltonian and you run it for the right amount of time, you'll end up with a quantum system of three spins that has the property that if you lose uh, any one out of the three, then just by acting on the remaining two, uh, you'll get a... In, in the right way, um, you'll get, you'll get a, a state of two spins. You throw away, say, the second one, and that spin will be in the state of the original system. And so you can make your quantum information robust in the sense that you can lose any one out of the three spins and still recover the original quantum information. And that's what we're going to need. Uh, and the details of it, I think this is originally due to Dan and collaborators. This is what the state looks like. It's not just the simple GHZ type uh, setup. Um, you need to do something a little bit more sophisticated. And we'll call this a 2-3 threshold quantum error correcting code, just because with, with any two out of the three shares, you can recover the quantum information. And here is the, um, the scenario that I want to talk about. And so we're going to have three pairs of request and reveal points. Uh, and the aspect ratio is a little bit off. But you can see here are my request points, y0, y1, and y2. And you should imagine them being on the vertices of an equilateral triangle in space. Uh, and the reveal points, Z0, Z1, and Z2, are on the midpoints of the line segments of that equilateral triangle, but translated in time. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to use them to, to handle this situation. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah. But so, well, no, I'll tell you right now. Uh, so we, we have this summoning task, right? that has been defined, that if, you, if you're given a, let, a list of request reveal pairs, uh, you, if the request arrives at, uh, at any one out of the uh, set of request points, then you should be able to exhibit the quantum information at the associated reveal point. Uh, and I sketched how this is actually equivalent to localizing quantum information in the causal diamond, which is the intersection of the future and past light cones of these request and reveal points. So here I've given a list of three request and reveal points. Uh, and so we're going to be interested in the summoning task for these request and reveal points, or equivalently, whether or not we can localize the same quantum information to all three diamonds. OK, so we're, we're replicate. This is, this is sort of a version of replicating quantum information in space time. Uh, we know we can't clone, but here we have a, a quite a non-trivial configuration of causal diamonds. Uh, and we're, going to, we're actually going to see that we can replicate the quantum information in all three diamonds. Um, and uh, right, so the, the only last, the last thing to know is that the reveal points are translated in time exactly uh, half as long as it would take for a signal to get uh, to travel along one of the, uh, the edges of that equilateral triangle. So if you look at this, um, say we have our quantum information originally located at the starting point, we could move it to the point y2. And then the diamond, y2, z2, would contain a copy of that information. We could then follow the, the, red, uh, the red line segments, are light rays. So we could just move that quantum information along this light ray to the point z1. And then the diamond z1 would also have a copy of that information. But from there, there's no way to move the information to z0 without traveling backwards in time. 
And the reason it can't be done is that these diamonds are specifically organized so that there's, it's possible to send a message from diamond one to diamond zero and diamond zero to diamond two and diamond two to diamond one in a loop. But that loop doesn't, it doesn't imply sort of transitively that you can send, quantum, uh, send a message uh, between any pair. Um, and so what we're going to do to actually succeed here is we're going to encode the quantum information into two, a 2-3 threshold quantum error correcting code. And so there are going to be three particles. Uh, and if we collect any two out of the three particles, we'll actually be able to uh, decode the quantum information. And so we'll send one particle to each of the request points. And then from there, the particle will be redirected along the, right, the, the red light rays, just like so. Okay. And it doesn't look like very much has happened, but my claim is that by doing so, we have replicated the same quantum information in, e in, uh, in all three of the causal diamonds. And so let's rewind a little bit to make sure that that's possible. Uh, at the final time, we have one particle in each of the causal diamonds, right? At the initial time, we have one particle in each of the causal diamonds. But if you look at what happens, the particle that is initially, say, in diamond two, moves to diamond one. And the particle that comes into diamond two was originally in diamond zero. So two different particles pass through each causal diamond. And so there is enough information in each causal diamond to reconstruct the quantum information. Okay? Uh, and this also reveals, uh, you can, sort of the connection to the, the summoning task. If you want to think of it in summoning terms, uh, if a request was made, say, at y2, uh, we already know that a particle is going to arrive at z2 from y0. But we could take the particle that was originally at y2 and was going to get forwarded along this light ray to z1 and just redirect it to z2, such that two particles would appear at z2 and we could decode the quantum information. That's how you can see that this localization is equivalent, or in, in this example, equivalent to, uh, to summoning. And so now here's a, just a sec, how much time do I have? Just to check. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's a more complicated scenario. Oh, we actually have four causal diamonds, and the way that you should see this diagram, each one of those causal diamonds is actually sitting on the face of this cube in space-time. Okay? Uh, and the question is, again, can the same quantum information be replicated in each and every one of these causal diamonds? And I would look at this. Uh, what are these? Oh, oh, sorry. So the Zs are, are on the midpoints of the... Uh, of the faces. So Z1 is on the front face and Z2 is on the right face. Yeah. It's, uh, I agree, I mean, uh, it's not, it's not operationally Well, in the summoning, in the summoning task, you ultimately only get one because if you got more than one, then you'd be cloning. But if you think passively, just in the in terms of the causal diamonds, right? That if you uh, if you looked at the uh, at the quantum state, uh, the reduced quantum state that rep you know, that represents the state on this on one of the diamonds, then the question would be: Does that uh, does the does the quantum state there contain the quantum information? Can you act unitarily on that density operator in such a way that you can actually recover a copy of the original state? And the answer is always going to be yes. And so I would, I mean, as long as, I, th I mean, I think as long as we uh, always append the statement replicated in space time, right? It's not replicated in space. Uh, um, I actually, I actually disagree. Um, so um, in this scenario that I just described, um, the, the situation to think about is not the summoning task, it, it is, but it's really just the, the very simple, uh, you distribute the three particles to the, re to the request points, and then you allow them to propagate along the, the light rays. And then the question is, uh, for example, does the diamond D2 contain the quantum information, right? Uh, it, if, we, if we have that process? And the answer is going to be yes. That if you look at the density operator uh, reduced to the diamond D, uh, D2, uh, yeah. There is an issue. You point to one device, and then there is an end. It changes uh, the root of the 
That's in the summoning task. So that's an equivalent question, but not the same question. So now you don't change the You don't change the path. If you don't change, you don't have enough information to You do. Oh, the, the, that information is all passed through the causal diamond. So this right? Okay, right, but now you can, uh, if you thicken this out just a little bit, then it will be the case, right, just from that picture that I, I drew before, that inside a causal diamond, uh, the, the evolution is going to be unitary, right? And so if the information is ever present inside the causal diamond, it's, it's present on each and every space-like slice. Right? I mean, in this picture, it doesn't look like that because I've, I'm sort of talking about the degenerate case. Uh, but if you actually thicken out the diamond just a little bit, then this is the, the way that it will work. I mean, I agree with you that you're never going to violate cloning. You're not going to find two copies of the same quantum information uh, on a space-like slice. But in this sort of expanded picture where you look at the space-time view, uh, these diamonds, I think the, in the only reasonable definition of what it means for the information to be in the diamond, which is that there exists, say, a completely positive trace-preserving map acting on the density operator of the diamond, say, uh, that will actually reveal the quantum information. It is there. Um, but I mean, we, I think we actually probably agree operationally on what is true and maybe disagree a little bit on language. Uh, five minutes? Oh, OK, so I better go a little bit quickly. Um, oh, so for this particular example, uh, it, it looks complicated, right? Uh, and the question is, again, going to be, can you replicate the same quantum information in the, each of these four diamonds? And if I were faced with this situation, not knowing what to do, what I would probably, uh, the, fir the first check would be, okay, well, let's try to exclude the possibility of replicating the quantum information in this case. And how would we exclude it? We just think about what we actually do understand, which is pairs of diamonds. And with pairs of diamonds, uh, if they are not causally related, we know that that actually will amount to a violation of the no cloning theorem if we can replicate the information. So we, we can just check for each and every one of these diamonds, uh, each pair, whether they're causally related. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it turns out that they are. And so the very naive check, which is just to think of the problem pairwise, uh, doesn't exclude the possibility of replicating the quantum information in this case. Um, and it turns out, uh, and I think this is quite remarkable, um, that's all you need to check. Uh, that, it, that in this particular case, the quantum information can be replicated in each and every one of the causal diamonds. Uh, and any time you have a set of causal diamonds in space-time that are all pairwise causally related, uh, then there exists a procedure uh, of d distributing quantum information into quantum error correcting codes and using teleportation to make sure that each and every one of the causal diamonds contains the, a copy of that quantum information. Uh, yeah with deference to, to Lev's objection, to, perhaps, to the language. Um, and another way of phrasing this is that if you want to know whether quantum information can be replicated in different, you know, a set of diamonds in space-time, all you have to do is look for the most obvious violations of cloning and causality. Uh, you just look pairwise at the situation. You don't, you know, there might be 100,000 diamonds there. You just look at them two at a time and just ask, if I could do it in this case, would, I, would, I've, would it amount to a violation of, of cloning and causality? And if the answer pairwise is no, then if you're ingenious enough, you'll be able to come up with a procedure to do it. Uh, now, unfortunately, I guess uh, I was going to tell you how to do it, um, but I don't think there's quite enough time. Uh, it's, it's, it's totally elementary, or it's, uh, it's really quite elementary. Um, well, maybe, maybe I'll do this and nothing more. Okay. Uh, so what we've already seen is that if there are only two diamonds, uh, and those two diamonds are causally related, then we can use the teleportation procedure to distribute the quantum, to replicate the quantum information in the two diamonds. So now let's just assume inductively, given a set of diamonds that are all causally related, uh, that on, a, on any set of n minus one diamonds that are all causally related, that there is a way to replicate the quantum information, which means to, uh, to succeed at the summoning task. So now we're gonna take our complicated picture, the one on the left, and just <coughs> reduce it to the graph of causal relationships. And so for example, uh, it's possible to send a message from request point y naught to reveal point z1. So there's a, an arrow from diamond naught zero to diamond one. And then we go through all pairs. And what we end up with is a directed graph, but with edges between every pair of vertices. OK, so let's look at this. Uh, we look at this graph. Uh, we can think of the subgraphs that we get by just deleting one vertex at a time. 
So there are four such subgraphs because there are four vertices. Uh, and each one of those corresponds to a sort of easier subproblem, right, where we've deleted one of the causal diamonds. And by assumption, uh, if we delete one of the causal diamonds, then we actually have a way of, of succeeding at the summoning task. So what do we do? We encode our quantum information into a threshold quantum error correcting code that can recover uh, with n shares, n particles, but we can recover from any n minus one of them. And then uh, we associate one particle to each of these subproblems. Okay, so for particle, uh, let, so let's suppose that the request appears at uh, location y1, so we ultimately want all the information to appear at reveal point z1. So for the first, uh, the particle associated with the first subproblem, uh, what we see is that it, well, by, by assumption, there's some way to succeed, and the quantum information uh, associated with particle one will appear at z1. For the second subproblem, there is no z1, so who knows what's going to happen? That will fail. But for, then for the next two, it will succeed. So for, a, for, for three out of the four particles, uh, the information of that particle will appear at location z1, and by the design of this quantum error correcting code, we'll be able to actually recover the information. Now everywhere, I, called, I, I put particles in quotes, and the reason is because this is an inductive procedure, right? So I start off, uh, and I have my quantum information, and I encode it into n particles. And then each of those n particles, I encode into n minus 1 particles. And each of those n minus 1 particles, I encode into n minus 2. And so the total number of particles required to actually make this work, the number of qubits, if I have n vertices, is actually n factorial. Um, and if we use the, say, even the very weak holographic bound that uh, Professor Beckenstein was speaking about in the previous talk, with just um, with just 55 diamonds, if you tried to actually localize the initial state to the surface of planet Earth, it would collapse to a black hole, which is not very, uh, not very practical. Um, but with smarter error correcting codes, you can actually get the number of particles down to the square of the number of diamonds, which is more, more reasonable. I'm not going to tell you how to do that, because uh, we don't have time. Um, so what have we learned? Uh, I mean, I think that what we've learned is that we, uh, that with what I think is a sensible definition of what it means for, uh, to replicate quantum information in space-time, um, there are actually a very interesting variety of ways that it can be done. And the only constraints on the ways that quantum information can be replicated in space-time are the simplest, most obvious ones, right? Very obvious violations of no cloning and causality. Um, it's easy to actually extend this to arbitrary spatial regions located at, uh, at different times, even if the spatial regions are not connected. Um, and if you do that, and also I should say, uh, similar ideas can be used to exclude quantum information from regions of space-time. And, uh, and this then becomes a generalization of the theory of quantum secret sharing. Uh, but you can now talk, which ar arises in quantum cryptography, um, but you can, you can now start talking about dynamically changing coalitions and moving participants and other things. Um, so what comes next? I would really like to convince someone to, to build this, uh, this example that we spoke about. Um, and it turns out that you can do it um, where the information, uh, with the information not being a spin, say a spin one particle, but you can, the information being the state of an optical mode. Uh, that there's a fairly you know, not too complicated quantum optics experiment that would realize this. Um, and this is obviously connected to more general theories, or trying to build a more general theory of quantum information processing in relativistic space time, like Adrian Kent has been doing. Um, and ultimately, uh, I would like to try to extract lessons uh, from what we've learned here for these more confusing problems, like the, uh, the black hole firewall question. I don't know what les lesson we should exclude, except that uh, naively excluding something that looks like cloning may not actually be what you should be doing, because at least we've seen in this example that uh, something tantamount to cloning, but not cloning, uh, can happen in very interesting ways. And so with that, I would like to end, but again, just uh, wish... Uh, wish the center well. Uh, the history of quantum information research here, uh, here in Israel, and specifically the Hebrew University, has really been tremendous over the years. And I think the creation of the center is only going to give more momentum to what is already uh, a tremendous effort. And so this meeting has been great, and I wish you well. Um, and thanks for your attention. OK, there are a few questions. I think this is really amazing. Um, I want to understand, so it seems to me like this, this has more, uh, so this has various applications also, for example, to quantum error correcting codes to understand uh, basically a characterization of entanglement um, in quantum error correcting codes. So is there any 
Is there any way to, to, to look at this and, and understand um, also distances of quantum error correcting codes? And, and uh, um, so you, you referred to quantum secret sharing, which is tightly related to quantum error correcting codes. So <coughs> did you think about uh, modeling <coughs> quantum error correcting codes with this uh, um, framework? So let's see. Um, so in the, in the improved efficiency construction that we give, um, this is a specific example of a code word stabilized quantum, st quantum code. And from that, it's pretty easy to build quantum, ac uh, quantum secret sharing schemes with arbitrary access structures, just like uh, Daniel and Richard Cleave did many years ago. Um, I don't know that it tells you much about the distance of the code. Um, like for the moment, I mean, this is, a, this is sort of an existence proof, so I haven't been at all concerned. I mean, actually, di distance is not really like for the what you need, uh, the property of the quantum error correcting code that you need to make this work, um, distance is not really the right way to talk about it. Um, so you end up needing to build a, a design a quantum error correcting code uh, that has one share for each edge of this graph of causal relationships with the property that if you, uh, that if you collect any of the shares associated with the edges uh, incident on a given vertex, that will be sufficient to reconstruct the, uh, the quantum information. And so this is actually a pretty funny kind of quantum error correcting code because there are roughly n squared shares, n choose two, um, and with n minus, n minus one shares, you, you, you can actually reconstruct the, the quantum information. And so in terms of the, the usual kinds of parameters we talk about, uh, this is a very unusual code, right? You're, you're reconstructing the information from a vanishing fraction of all the qubits, um, but in such a way that you obviously don't violate the no cloning theorem. Um, but Having said that, I mean, maybe, maybe there's room. Uh, I, mean, I think maybe you might be able to learn about quantum error correcting codes that are going to be transformed dynamically in particular ways this, uh, using this uh, kind of line of thinking. Yeah. I'm trying to understand the relation to topological uh, states ah. uh, naturally. Yeah. Okay, fair uh, enough. So, that, I, I put that up there mostly to, you know, to make con well, to intrigue people like you maybe. Uh, but the, the only, uh, let's see, I, I probably actually have a slide somewhere about this. Um, I'm not used to this. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, the condition for being able to replicate quantum information uh, was just that it was possible to send it, you know, for, e for any pair of causal diamonds, you had to be able to send a message uh, from one diamond to the other in, in one of the two directions. So now if we flatten that all to the same, uh, the same time, right, then what does the condition become? Uh, it becomes that uh, the spatial regions actually have to overlap uh, because sending a message at all, uh, you know, with, no, with no time just means that the regions overlap. And so then the condition uh, for replication of quantum information is just that you have to have overlapping spatial regions. Um, and that's kind of, uh, obviously, if you're talking about topological order, there are many more conditions that you want to talk about. But that's going to be sort of the most basic condition that has to be satisfied uh, if you're going to distribute quantum information non-locally uh, in, you know, say, in a, in a, in a 2D. Uh, so you're saying yeah, the condition will be that the, 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 the information is distributed non-locally but in a region of space that's connected or? or, or um, well, yeah, again, I don't want to, I don't want to claim too much for this. Like mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's almost a trivial condition if you reduce to, uh, to a fixed time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, yeah, what I would say is that if you, so here's a, here, here's a picture, right? So we want to actually replicate quantum information in some spatial regions. So here I have one spatial region. So it's easy to put the information in that one spatial region. So now here, here are two spatial regions. So it's easy to, repli or to, to replicate the information in those two regions because all I do is put the information in the overlap, right? So now if I have three regions, uh, I can do it still because I can use one of those two, three threshold error correcting codes and put uh, one copy in this overlap, one copy in this overlap, one copy in that overlap, and any region overlaps twice. Um, and then if I put in a third region, I can look at this one and say, oh, well, is it possible to replicate the information in all of these regions? The answer is going to be no because the green region doesn't overlap purple. But if I extend green 
uh, you know, even with, in this not dis disconnected way with a, another piece over there, then there is a way to replicate the information uh, in each of these, uh, these systems, uh, each of these, these four different colored regions. And topological order is something much more specific, uh, but this is sort of the, the most basic condition that's going to apply to how you could replicate information there. In your title, there is a quantum information. And if you make kind of uh, accent on a quantum, mm -hmm. and they'll say classical is not particularly important, then you really can uh, have a, qu a quantum information in one place and make teleportation without classical information on a chain from one to another. And in this way, uh, you will move your quantum information to any other place, never mind forward, backward, because uh, you can make teleport to any space like separated place, and then adding classical information, which will be in all these teleportation uh, settles, you, uh, you will, in this way, uh, you will achieve moving quantum information from any point to any other uh, set of uh, regions. So, I think, so I, I guess uh, you, maybe you're trying to, uh, so what you've described is clearly not operational, because you have to, well, you have to post-select, right? No, like no, 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 you, no? you, you just, there is a one point which you want to get. It. So in this point, when you get your teleportation, uh, you, you get your, your quantum, uh, from this point, you don't send teleportation anymore. You, st you stop there. Any other point, if you don't, if Y N doesn't uh, get that he uh, uh, should actualize, he will send his particle f to, to, to the next one. The one which wants to get doesn't send it, so it will stay there. Okay. And all others, they just perform the teleportation. They will get these classical numbers, the results of Bell measurement. When you collect this Bell, uh, these classical numbers all over the space, mm -hmm. put this to this guy there, he, even, uh, he will know exactly the state. But the quantum information will be already there immediately. Uh, I guess, from my point of view, uh, the quantum information is the, is the combination of that half of the EPR pair and the classical transmission. And without the classical transmission, all you have is a system that's maximally mixed. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe, maybe this might be a good uh, starting point for the lunch discussion. And uh, thank you for everybody that's saying that you speak as well. Um, 